So for me, because I work in advocacy, I do a lot of like voting rights work. And so everything that you're talking about reminds me of a lot of these voter suppression laws. Like what do you do? You study black voting patterns. You study when black people vote the most. You study what day they vote the most. And then you go and you change the law to say, okay, now you can't vote on Sundays. Okay, you vote at 7. Now we end early voting at 5 p.m. And a part of it is... I always argue that academia reinforces white supremacy. Of course. Um, and trains people to uphold white supremacy uh, through the research methods, through the way you're able to research. Absolutely. Through the fact, through the, the methods you're able to use, and even the subject matter. Like, going to the IRB, I know it's supposed to, like, help people, but I've always argued that it is, it is a tool that reinforces white supremacy. And um, as an academic, how do you, as someone who works... Um, to delegitimize white supremacy and interrupt white supremacy. Like, how have your experiences been in academia trying to like, educate and engage people around not only the history, but the practice? I so appreciate this question, and I thank you, my sister, for recognizing that. I say at, in, in my book very um, assertively that I, I'm not writing this book to follow any widely accepted academic standard or practice as it pertains to how research is presented or how knowledge is supposed to be shared in, in the written form. Um, and so I, I reject that, which is why, you know, I am in the process of, of completing doctoral work, but I don't know if I'm going to um, finish I have, I'm grappling with that because this was my uh, thesis, this is my dissertation research, and they just were not um, open to it in the ways in which I wanted to present it. So there are constraints that really deter us because um, I know that my, it demotivated me. I don't want to follow the white model. I've been constrained long enough. I'm tired of white supremacy. And why should I spend another $100,000 of my money out of my savings to go through this process that's, that's going to bring pain and suffering into my life? So mm-hmm. that's one question or one answer to that question. The other, though, is we have to understand all of the ways in which we are inculcated within a culture that is not designed for our benefit. Mm -hmm. So, for example, and I use this example pretty commonly, our young black babies come home from, let's say, first grade, second grade, third grade, and they're not doing well based on this white educational model in the way that knowledge is being presented in the boringness of the, the subjects or the ineffectiveness of how the material is being presented, and we blame them. We uh, most oftentimes presume that something is wrong with them, and we can't get psych ourselves to understand that the impulse to think that or that the idea around that is rooted in whiteness and white supremacy mm-hmm. because our babies have gifts and skills that are not affirmed or validated by these white educational institutions. True. True. And so when we, when we don't reinforce for them that, hey, it's not you, it's the system, but I'm going to work hard with you to try to get you through these courses so that you can be successful in this white supremacist country, but if nothing is wrong with you, when we make them feel bad, we cut into their confidence, we shut them down, we create angry babies who no longer want to learn, and it's, destru- it's a destructive cycle. So anything that you br- embrace as a measure of success in the white American value structure automatically disenfranchises those black people who do not reach it, whether Mm -hmm. it's the way that we speak and present, whether it's our degrees, our economic status, our positionality. If you're if you don't haven't accomplished anything, then you're not valuable to the society. It's just like the quote from the book that I read. That's essentially what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Wow. 